So obtaining this is the forward direction. And if we are interested in estimating the properties and structure, we then go in the inverse direction, which is going from data to the model. The theory that allows to formulate these problems is a probabilistic theory in which we define the knowledge of uh, the model that we have in, on the basis of uh, a probability density function that will describe our present state of knowledge. And in this uh, model parameter space, then we define a probability density, which is called a posterior probability density. This posterior probability density combines prior information that we have before an observation and the information provided by the observation itself, which is given by a likelihood function. So the likelihood function actually measures how the data updates the prior information to build up the posterior probability information or probability density. Typically, there are many way, uh, various ways to formulate the likelihood function, but typically it can be understood as the probability of the observed data conditioned by a given, uh, for a given configuration <coughs> of the model. For instance, I have here a simple example. If we assume <coughs> that our data uncertainties both modeling uncertainties as observa observable uncertainties follow a Gaussian model, then we would state that the difference between the calculated data and the observed data will be given by this Gaussian distribution in multi <coughs> multivariate space, and this would be the likelihood function to be used. There are many other uh, distributions that can be used for the likelihood functions. We are used to see and to formulate the inverse problems in this type of plane formulation, so in which we have a particular uh, set of data, say density, and then we observe some survey that is uh, an effect of this data, uh, this model, sorry, uh, a model which is the density and the data which is the gravity, and then we relate gravity <coughs> and density a forward model or, a or an inverse model. So this is the plane setting. Okay. However, if we place ourselves in going to a more realistic representation of a model, well, when we were have different scales, different properties within the model, we start to increase the complexity. So this is another stage in this complexity in, we, in which uh, we have different types of surveys under the same object being reservoir, mantle, whatever, okay? For, I for instance, this could be gravity, this could be EM, electromagnetic, and as we have these different types of observations, we need to have in the model then the appropriate physical properties related to these observations, which will be, in the case of gravity, the density, if we use electromagnetic, this will be ele electric properties, so we have two components of the models. And as well, we can connect these components of the model with some other properties of the object, like for, like for instance, lithology. So uh, an example of this uh, layer of parameters could be the lithology. So the lithology can condition the distribution of the density, can condition the distribution of the uh, electric parameters, and connect them all internally. So that's a, a hierarchical structure. <coughs> so in this case, we are passing from the plane formulation to a hierarchical structure in which we have layers of models, in which one layer of model is a primary parameter that condition other parameters of the model. And then these parameters are linked to the data. But the situation can be even more flexible because we can have observations at different levels, in fact. We can have observations directly from the primary parameters. And we may have some more flexible connections in what is a network. This is a Bayesian network in which I'm going to speak a little bit more later, in a, in a few minutes, after we see some examples. I will show first some examples and then come back to these 
a Bayesian network formulation for the probabilities. Let's consider now the probability distribution for the posterior state of knowledge. In the plain formulation, as I told you, we have a, the basic uh, expression for the posterior, where we have this as a product of the likelihood <coughs> function and the prior probability density. This is a normalization constant. So how we can build up our posterior probability in these two more complicated cases? Well, first of all, we have the same setting of a joint likelihood, but as the different surveys have uncertainties uncorrelated, so uncertainties of, a, of a one survey data, say seismic, are not related statistically with the uncertainties of uh, electromagnetic survey, for instance, then the likelihood functions can be uh, factorized. So actually, instead of a joint likelihood, we have a product of individual likelihoods for each of the types of data. Similarly, in this setting as well, the likelihood function will be factorized. For instance, we have this data two depends only on these two components of the model and provides us a likelihood function for just these two component, component, uh, components of the model. And about the prior information, probability density, this row here, it can be decomposed according to the chain rule. So we will have prior probabilities for the primary parameters and conditional probabilities of secondary parameters condition it by the primary. I think you want an M1, yeah. right? In the first factor? L1 of M1? In the more In which, one? which line? Last equation. This one? Last equation. Last oh, last equation. L1 of M1. First L1? One? Yeah. Oh, L1 of M1. L1 and M1. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. That's just adjusting last night this <laughs> slide. Just so you know we're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this one, L3, 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 that's good. Okay. And L1. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And now we have then the conditional. So we have, for instance, here a, a prior information in M1, which is this one, and then a conditional a probability density is M2 conditional to M1. Okay. For instance, this M4 will be conditioned simultaneously by, <coughs> by M1, M2, and M3. So uh, that's uh, the way the posterior probability decomposes. Once the, this probability is decomposed, it's important because now we know each of these uh, forward functions. We, have a, we can model the uncertainties associated. Uh, so we can model each of the terms of the likelihood functions of the conditional probabilities. So no, some of these conditional probabilities could be rock physics, for instance, if we have porosity, we can estimate velocity. So we, we are going to show, I'm going to show practical examples. Or could be changes of a scale. Sometimes we have data that uh, require some scale of the properties and other data like well logs that works with a smaller scale and then the relationship would be a change of a scale relationship between these parts or components of the model. Once the posterior probability PDF has been modeled, there are several approaches to pull realizations and to obtain solution from the probability densities. I mentioned here two major approaches. One is the optimization, which consists in starting at some point, some configuration of the model, calculate gradients, Hessians, into all these combination of, of the network, and uh, Okay, and uh, 
and, co and converge iteratively to a maximum of the posterior probability density. These are typically model spaces that have a very low, large number of parameters. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of parameters if we work with a reservoir or, well, the mantle, etc. And the other approach is the sampling approach in which we pick up, um, we produce samples in proportion to the posterior probability density. With this approach, we have an exploration of the, of the uncertainties as well and could also uh, show multiple uh, mo modes in which in the case of the optimization we have some problems sometimes with converging to local modes. But both methods are, uh, are very useful. And we have solved the problems in many cases in the two type of approach. There are other approaches as well. So let's go to some applications, some examples. So I treat uh, first, I present first the uh, uh, problem of gravity and magnetic inversion for uh, the estimation of the structure of a sedimentary basin. This was done in a region of uh, central Venezuela. And in that place, the objectives were to define where the basement in 3D was uh, located, the basement. Uh, we have also uh, an interest in uh, discriminating pre-Cretaceous and Cretaceous and post-Cretaceous sediment. So uh, <coughs> we built up a 3D model in which the parameters are the interfaces. The interfaces can vary, yes? Is the blue feature across the top and the gravity coincident with the yellow feature in the magnetic? Uh, well, uh, these... Uh, the one up there, is, I see one stripe across the top. Right. Big blue, blue blob and it goes across. And beneath it, I see a very similar geometric feature, but I'm wondering if they are coincident they are or adjacent. No, they, they, are, they are not very related in the sense that this uh, is mostly because we have Caribbean cross here, which has higher magnetic susceptibilities. So this is actually elevated values. The yellow here is elevated values, whereas here we have uh, low values. And this is because of the depth of the sediment in the case of the gravity. And so in the interpretation, we find ourselves asking whether this is a feature of the measurement or a feature of the Earth at that point, and whether the story that relates the two is a causal story or a story about uh, an artifact? It is a causal story. It is a causal story. It is a causal story. <coughs> I, I could explain a little bit. Yeah, thank you. No, I'll let you go. But it's, it's it a good illustration of things that yeah. might be a mismatch, but not a Gaussian uh, distribution. So, okay, but uh, yeah, uh, let's take, take um, say, uh, mentioned that this is gravity and uh, this is magnetic data, so they will respond to different things. And yeah, have elaborate complex yeah. stories about the physics and the and rocks is, yeah, that could this become is a not Gaussian difference when we're doing the No, in this case it's basically to the lithology. It's basically to the lithology. I'll come back in a sec because uh, then we have a section and we can see it better in a section to see uh, to, to interpret this data according to the results. <coughs> so the setting uh, in the model, we have a hierarchical type of model where we have, this is a liturgical model. <coughs> in the model we have the boundaries between the different uh, layers. And these layers are two of sediments, crystalline basement and mantle. So the, the boundaries will move in the different uh, realizations. I am, I'm going to solve this with a Monte Carlo approach, a sampling approach. But also, in, innerly, to, e to each uh, layer, internally, there is a grid of uh, points for the properties. Where we have the density and the magnetic susceptibility, and they can also change according to the appropriate distribution of uh, probabilities for these properties. So if we are in a, a crystalline basement, we characterize with appropriate data how the distribution of magnetic susceptibility and density is for the crystalline basement, for the mantle, and uh, the sediments. To uh, generate then a realization 
of the magnetic susceptibility and density for the different cells of the model uh, and calculate the data. This, are, this is the observed data. <coughs> then uh, the, the algorithm works by generating uh, a configuration of this model, then conditionally producing and feeding the properties inside, <coughs> calculating the data, comparing it, observed and calculated data, and then it is a, the, the realization is accepted or rejected according to a metropolis sampling. So it, uh, the metropolis sampler <coughs> warrants that this posterior probability is sampled in a long run of the chain. <coughs> Uh, in this case, because this is a 3D model, we run it in 10 million realizations to establish the appropriate statistics. There is a burning, burning period in which the initial model starts to feed the data. Then it keeps all time feeding the data by exploring the uncertainty and variability of the model. I'm going to show just one of the layers, which is the basement layer in some of these realizations. Simultaneously, the different layers are also changing in the model. Uh, every time uh, the depth of the layer changes, then the calculated gravity data and magnetic data also change, but within the uncertainty. So we can see that all the realizations in the chain satisfy <coughs> within uncertainties the observed data. This is Dr. Bernie. This is after burning. Would have been fun to show the previous. Yes. See how wild it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm amazed how stable yeah. it is. Do you have in mind the order of magnitude of degrees of freedom that you have in the version? Uh, the order of magnitude of what? So of degrees of freedom in the inversion. Inversion. Uh, okay. I did this a uh, long time ago. But, it's like but we will boxes. have a ki kind of a, a kind of 50, 50 uh, 100 cells here, and uh, maybe 80 here. So we're talking uh, so 8,000, and then we have in depth. So there's a lot of. Uh, mm -hmm. So actually, what we do, what we do is that uh, about a million for per air, per each parameter in the model, at least <coughs> 10, 10 realizations more. So we must uh, multiply by 10 or 100 to have a sufficiently long chain. So, but we uh, examine the, so we examine this curve to see that the data have converged and we have a sufficiently long uh, chain to make them the posterior statistics here. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Oh yeah. Yeah. So what about the topography of this area? Okay, yeah, the topography yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yes, topography. yeah, good question. Uh, the topography is one of the fixed parameters. So it's not, uh, of course, so it's not changing because we know it. Mm -hmm. It's included, it's included. As well, the, the bottom of the sea, it's included, but it's fixed. So actually what is random are the, the rest of the, the three horizons. Uh, <coughs> and the algorithm essentially looks for randomly a position and then modifies it, recalculates, accepts, rejects, and goes like that. But as well, then another set of realizations, sometimes the, the modifications are position of the horizons, but sometimes are the properties. So uh, we have also, and this is a section north to south, this section through the model, and uh, we see here the um, basement, and we see that uh, the density is variating in the, in the layers. There is a statistical model imposed so that this uh, variation of the density has characteristic uh, ranges. Okay? Um, this is the this is Moho here, this is Moho here, and this is the mantle, which has high <laughs> density. So you're saying the model is the values of the properties in the pixels, but you constrain them somehow to have... And I have a statistical model. So, say the density change here, uh, also the probability depends on the neighbors, according to the statistical model, and the data. So, 
So is that implemented as a constraint or like a prior? It's, it's a constraint on the smoothness of yeah. the solution. So we have a small range, we could have small features, and we have a longer range, we have longer features. And did you compare with doing this using a, the two approaches you showed, the optimization sort of approach or the Monte Carlo, did they give similar results or did you just pick one? They usually do both and they do in most cases the same results if we use the same statistical models for both. But the Monte Carlo should be more general. When it's, it's more general acid. because we are go we have the um, description of the posterior uh, distributions. I'm going to show this. Uh, this is uh, uh, the part where the the sediments are deeper here, and uh, this is the estimated value, the expected value of the basement depth. So we can see here that the basement is deeper, so that's why we have more lower densities here. And uh, for the features at the north, and it comes to, to the first question, we have high magnetic susceptibility here. And this is because this is Caribbean, uh, Caribbean crust here instead of continental. And uh, in this uh, Caribbean crust, magnetic susceptibilities could be higher. And this is also taken into account to the model. So we have high magnetic uh, susceptibilities. These, uh, these are the ones that uh, are giving origin to the high uh, anomalies in the magnetic field. So in this case, it's, um, it's uh, conditioned uh, to the values of the properties due to the lithology. Well, the 10 million realizations help us to, because we cannot see the 10 million realizations. So the idea is to um, <coughs> estimate the posterior distributions. So with the 10 million realizations actually taking away the burning period, to be more precise, would be less than 10 million. Uh, we can calculate then the probabilities for each time, each type of the lithotypes. The first layer of sediments, these are pre-cretaceous pre sediments, sorry, uh, this would be the post-Cretaceous, uh -huh. pre-Cretaceous. So we can see that in this area we have very thin or absent pre-Cretaceous. Whereas it's thicker here, this is the section. And well, the location of the basement and, and more more depths in this zone. Well, this is the the example, we of course can see this in the different sections, north-south, and different ways of presenting the probability distributions. And it's an example in this gravity and in magnetic inversion. Let's talk to a different scale and a different object, which is uh, a reservoir. I'm showing an example of uh, applying the rock physics and seismic inversion into the description of the reservoir and we typically use, in this case, a reflection seismic data, and we are going to use the full gather, not partial stacks, after seismic migration. So it works more or less CD, CDP by CDP. So uh, small parameters, we have a first layer of the elastic isotropic parameters, including density, parameterized here by P velocity, S velocity, the source wavelet in, in our in implementation, source wavelets are simultaneously estimated as well with, with a prior information. So this is the secondary layer of all parameters that determine the, the seismic data. And we have then the reservoir layer of parameters describing lithology. Uh, in particular, this is the shale fraction. This is a siliciclastic uh, zone, so we have shell fraction as a good parameter that describes the lithology, the total porosity, and fluid saturations. <coughs> so according to a rock physics model that is calibrated specifically to this reservoir, then we can predict from a given configuration of the reservoir parameters what the elastic parameters are, and then model the seismic. The idea is then that we are able to estimate through all this modeling in the inverse direction 
uh, directly the reservoir parameters. In particular, we wanted to estimate the fluid saturation of gas in a gas reservoir with some uh, data and rock physics calibration that we did. Just to be clear, the only data are seismic data. There's no other in this case, yeah, this is a case with only one seismic data. But you could, you could in principle, have like a well log or something. Well logs, sorry? You well could logs. add a well log that yeah, would make it another show, data source. It shows this. I will show an example of this. And the complexity here is, uh, <laughs> as, as you say, it's a single type of data, but the complexity here will, ha will be in having these two sets, these two layers of parameters, related with two types of physics. We have the elastic formulation here, actually uh, this is calculation of reflectivities, and we have the real physics model here. So we are chaining two types of uh, modeling. And having, of course, prior information on this. Uh, in this area, the presence of gas in the target uh, layer produces a typical sort of reflection uh, that increases the reflectivity with the incidence angle. Uh, we have then, depending on the gas, uh, on the gas uh, proportion and the gas uh, fraction, we have that uh, this is water saturation, so as having more gas, we have a stronger reflection. But this reflection is even stronger for larger offsets. It's in the top of the reservoir and in the base of the reservoir. And uh, I present here a solution with the Monte Carlo approach as well. We characterize the rock physics using well logs and then um, relating, as usual, the porosity is very well related with the acoustic impedance, for instance. This uh, gray band represents uncertainties. Yeah. And uh, we have the dependence uh, with water saturation as well. So uh, as we have uh, less uh, water saturation, we have a larger gas presence, then we have a reduction in the acoustic impedance. And this is the <coughs> looking in, in the two, two dimensions, well, three dimensions. Okay. And we set up the chain in the following way. I'm showing here uh, locations of four wells in the area, but take a look only in one line, which is one well. So. We are going to generate realizations according to the prior information jointly for the porosity, shale fraction, and water saturations. These uh, magenta lines indicate pl plus or minus one standard deviation in the prior information. And this is for the water saturation. Then for each realization of the reservoir parameters, we use the rock physics model to calculate the PBS and density. And the panels on the right is the horizontal yes, we, axis, I'm angle going of to, scattering? Yeah. This is the observed seismic, and this is in ang angle domain. So this is so the gathering. scattering angle. Gathering angle, yes. And observed is averaged over many uh, locations, or it's at a single location that matches the well? This is the, the scene. This is for this realization. But I will, I will show more, more examples. Yeah, but observed. Observed. Uh, it can be observed in a variety of locations, midpoints. No, the, no, this is in angle as well, and only in the location of the well. But on the other On the right, right, where it says observed seismic. <coughs> oh, sorry, the observed. Uh, this is a single gather in the A location. single gather at a well location? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes. And what we can see here, we can see here the ABO effect, the reservoir is uh, located here, and we have the top red is the bright spot or strong negative reflection in the top of the gas reservoir that increases with the angle as we expected for this reservoir and at the bottom the uh, and this is the bottom of the layer the reflection associated with the bottom of the layer this is a gas this is a well that uh, is a gas producer so we have gas here and this is the typical thing <coughs> the second one also we have gas and it's a typical signal, you see the ABO effect here. Also in this one, in the last one, there is no gas. This 
wet uh, well, only water, and uh, you cannot see the typical strong signal red and, and blue here. Uh, well, these are realizations associated to the specific, uh, this is the calculated data associated to the specific realizations. When we have um, <coughs> gas presence, we have a reduction of the density, a reduction of the P, and a stronger, a stronger um, calculated data. <coughs> so in the saturation, there are two curves? Like saturation is this, the red curve. And then the, the other curve is like a Gaussian? It's the prior. Prior. Okay. Prior. Yeah. One, one standard deviation of the prior. So actually the prior is, is here, but it's water, but we have larger saturation. Uh, larger standard deviation for, for the reservoir. And a series of realizations uh, that are picked at regular intervals in the chain once, once it has uh, converged. Uh, what we can see, we can see that most of the water saturations rea in the realizations for the well that has gas, most of them shows uh, an important presence of gas. Whereas that in the bottom well that has no gas, you can see that the frequency of gas realizations I is very, very weak. And when it has some gas, it, ha it shows only a very poor possible saturation. Right. So the method uh, allows to discriminate the presence of gas um, in this area. But the objective is not to only check whether we can discriminate gas or not. The idea of this method is to estimate the saturation itself. So uh, then we average over the chain. We made uh, several thousand realizations for the calculation of the posterior probabilities. And then we have here about the posterior uh, frequencies, the accumulated uh, probability density, showing for the for an example of well having the gas type um, having gas in the well presence of gas then we have uh, the appropriate uh, high probability for the uh, high gas saturation whether in a dry well we have then very poor estimation uh, very poor gas saturation so you partition the results by whether it was producing or not by some criterion like well, that right there. Yes. That, that right there. Yes. It's present or not present. Then right. Commercially, commercially, producer or not. But uh, in addition, this is a summary on eight wells in the area. And these uh, magenta curves show the saturation calculated from the well logs. Uh, so we ha had a good match in this well producing, good producing wells that the saturation was well estimated. This is the median, the black line. Uh, we have uh, here in a, this interesting result, because this is a well producing gas, but the saturation of gas was poor. And actually, it was poor. But actually, the method also provides the, the an acceptable result that the saturation here was uh, smaller than in these kind of wells. These were absent. Okay. This was uh, a, wrong, a wrong negative, and this well was just in the border of the, of the reservoir, and the seismic signal did not contain the good reflections because of that. So in the movie, were, were all those different realizations roughly equally probable, or did they range in probability? No, they are equally probable according to the posterior probability density. Okay. So this is uh, pulled from the combined posterior after the burning period. So there are probability above some, they're, they're within uh, some region of the maximum probability, something like that. Yes, they, they are in the, in the sampling stage, in the sampling stage, and they were taken at regular intervals in this chain, so yeah. they are equally probable. So we are seeing here the frequency we, we see later in the plot. So we can see that 90% of the cases, well, a large percent of the cases show the, the gas here, whereas here, very few, which is something like that. 
Well, I will come up uh, to continue with a little bit uh, more on the inference networks for a more, a little bit more of complexity and showing two examples in this uh, case. Uh, this is a, a, then a network which is not the typical, you know, three layers because we have data at different points. We may have uh, some other connections. What is important in these networks is that they uh, are no, should not have cycles. And these graphs are called direct acyclic graph. Okay. So this direct acyclic graph with the appropriate prob probabilities defined is an inference network. It's what is called an inference network. So we can model in the forward direction through the network or in the inverse direction with these methods I'm describing. So we have a set of, set of nodes, but each node is a component of the model. This could be the density, this could be the litology, this could be the interfaces, so on. Uh, and the inner relations then are the corresponding to each of the causal. These are kind of causal or statistical relations between the components of the model. When we have the DAG, direct acyclic graph, and then uh, we apply the same logic explained. The likelihood functions, the uncertainties are unrelated. So each, uh, each uh, of the nodes which has an observation will contribute to the posterior probability with a likelihood function factor. So we will have to perform the posterior probability here for likelihood functions, which are here. Okay, uh, the nodes which are called the ancestors are the nodes which does not have any conditioning to them. These ancestor nodes provide a prior information because we may have no, we may know something in the past for them. Okay, so we can define a prior information. If we don't have anything, we use a non-informative prior information, and each of the links between the model components provide a conditional probability density. So conditional probability of these components depending on these other two components, for instance. So in this, uh, in this way, the posterior probability is configured. And then again, can be solved using Monte Carlo methods or optimization. I'll show one case with Monte Carlo, another with optimization. This case is a, at a global scale to estimate temperature and composition of the earth mantle. And this is work done by colleagues at Swiss Federal Institute of, Te of Technology in Australia, Omar, uh, Amir Khan and co-authors, for instance. I'm showing the results based on this approach. And uh, <coughs> the method and uh, forward direction is uh, presented here. So they first make realizations of the temperature and composition of the mantle. And this composition are oxides of the mantle, the different types of oxides of the mantle. Then they use a Gibbs energy minimization to predict mineralogies according to temperature and composition. So they have then mineral fractions. And combining temperature and mineral fractions, they use a model to predict elastic parameters, attenuation, and density. Then they start constraining this model and these PP velocities, uh, P velocity, P wave velocities, and start constraining this model using the moment of inertia, the total earth uh, mass, seismic S travel times, and seismic pre uh, P travel times. And uh, use this in a 1D model to estimate uh, a, a profile of the temperature and composition average spherically in the Earth. And the results are shown here. So they have, this is the prior temperature uh, information provided. You see a wide uncertainties on the posterior uh, distribution of PDF for the temperature once they constrain with the tomography <coughs> and other parameters. So uh, as you see, they improved a lot in the certainty of the distribution of the temperature. 
And here they are comparing with other researchers' results that use a different type of methods. But the temperature here is a proxy for propagation speeds for PNS stiffnesses? Sorry? How does temperature relate to the measurements? Okay. <coughs> The temperature is related uh, to the me measurements because it will influence the elastic moduli, elastic moduli, and they will influence the mineral fractions. So it's relating not that the temperature determines uh, a, a heat sensitive property, but that the mineral fractions change. Yeah, that, yeah. The that's the idea of this method, that this so chemistry directly. The temperature related. is related through chemistry uh -huh. of uh -huh. the rocks. Yeah. So Which in turn relates to the elastic. Yeah. Let's see that this is the virtue of this approach to to combine into s property that influences an intermediate one, and then this one is observed. And, and the the, uh, the curve on the next slide, the overlaid curves, they use different data. The other authors that are compared, Brown and Shankland and Deschamps and Tom Perry, they use different. <coughs> What did they do? I mean, yeah, it's, it's I, the I, same I, order of magnitude. Yeah. Otherwise, it's very different. Yes, the details I I know I don't know because okay. it's, but That's just you can look for Cap Park. Yeah, you can look for the paper. It can, Amir can, uh, and co-authors and, and have all, all the details. But it's independent. The, yeah, in the, it has nothing to do with this stochastic method. It was an other. They have involved a different story about yeah. the relationship of temperature to chemistry yeah. to seismic. And if it did, it would give a non-Gaussian difference. Right. Yes. Yeah. They have a different model to, to relate them. Or maybe they used a, a, a deterministic one with no, no exploration of the uncertainties. But uh, it's a matter to, to go into the details to, to read. And about the composition, they obtain composition for the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And here we are comparing results of the posterior and the prior distribution. So as you can see, all priors are very wide, so non-informative. And uh, they, they have gained a lot of information in these posteriors about the different uh, composition of the different oxides, like iron oxide and so on for the lower mantle, what they conclude about the composition of this oxide. So this is a way to look the tomography. So uh, travel times and then going into composition and temperature is an interesting view into the tomography. So trying to, to see deeper, to see what is behind the screen, another, another level of parameters. I come back to a local example in reservoirs. In this case, conditioning to well locks, the information we have a similar setting of reservoir properties, elastic properties, but this time, <coughs> this is an inversion conditioning to well lock data. So we have some locations of the 3D model where we know from well data, or we have observed some well data. So well data sometimes is taken like, well, the hard data, but in fact they, they have a lot of uncertainty. So there is uncertainty, there are uncertainties in this relation. At each location in the 3D, it can be obtained the well location to compare with the well data observation. But the posterior probability includes then the likelihood to the well data. And the result I'm going to show this time is solved with optimization. We solve it in the two ways, Monte Carlo and optimization. Optimization calculating the, the gradient and uh, full Hessian through all these relations. That can be so basically minimizing this. It's the logarithm of the function and minimizing it by calculating the gradient, the Hessian, etc. The rock physics is characterized based on well logs. It's the same same area I showed before, but this uh, this uh, case we have uh, the conditioning to the well data, and the, I'm showing here in each column results at different situations. In the middle column, I'm showing the only seismic data, so we put a very large uncertainty on the well logs. It's like erasing the well logs, so we have only what the seismic data tells. 
and this is the acoustic impedance and estimated gas saturation is located the gas in this uh, layer. We have a well which is W1 that is conditioning, will be used to condition the inversion and a test well W2 that is going to be used to check the results. So in the combined, when uh, the inversion is conditioned to the well data, then we obtain these third column results. At first look, we can see that these results have a very uh, an increase in vertical resolution. And this increase in vertical resolution is edited. It comes from the conditioning well, which is at a high resolution, much uh, higher than the seismic data. This is one of the things we can, oh, we can see. As well, the uncertainty uh, have, uh, in have decreased. So the result is more certain about the saturation of, uh, of gas here. And other issues relating with the mythology, because there is a seal here that is better defined, uh, which was not very clear in the porosity of the seismic inversion only. Uh, this is the result by eliminating the, the seismic component. Only with the well conditioning, we, it turns to be a creeping process, what is called in geostatistic creeping. So just extrapolating what happens in the well through the horizons to the other well. If we check correlations to the blind well test, we see that all correlations are improved in the combined inversion compared to the separate. But it's, it sounds very logic. If we have two types of information and we use the two, we must have some, some better result. It sounds quite logic, but it's all made quantitatively and formally so that each type of uh, information contributes. Question. That's called geostatistical seismic inversion. Uh, yes? Um, the the left-hand panel shows mm -hmm. geometry that must have been picked from something. Yes, that's picked from and the seismic data. On the right-hand panels, I guess that that is not, not part of. No, it uh, isn't. So if you look at the residuals between say the picture on the left and the picture <coughs> on the right. Does it look Gaussian or does it look like there's a geometry uh, of picking horizons? Right, you mean the seism uh, seismic residuals? Coherent, uh, uh, residual mm. pattern. The seismic residuals. The, the, the residuals. In the data. This is always in the data. The residual between the measured and the model, does it look Gaussian or does it show um, coherent patterns. Uh, okay, yes, I have uh, this in, in uh, let me see if I included, yeah, fortunately I included this the, in, a, it's not the same area, but it's in an Ecuador well, and this, but it's the same process. In the first line, we have a seismic alone inversion, so uncertainties of the well log, this is the well log, have been very large, no, no well information. And you see the seismic residuals here. You see that still there are some seismic receivable. And the second line is the geostatistical condition to the log. And you can see that we have now the higher <coughs> resolution features. And uh, if these two types of information would not be coherent, you would expect to have uh, worse receivables. But in fact, what you can see is that the receivables improve. So it's still coherent, but not lower yet. amplitude. Even I, I'm, so I'm looking to see, I see yellow on top of white, well, but, but I see the same yeah. pattern that's more or less conformal to the, the yeah. line that's there. Yeah, if you, if you analyze the seismic receivables, you would say that this is a better fit. I would say it's a better yeah. picture, yeah. but that the residual is coherent, coherent. not Gaussian. Yeah. So, so what it's telling is that, uh, that the two types of information matches very well. I'm just about to fin I, we have finished. So, well, there is uh, just a final into what are challenging problems. I was trying to sketch here a, a complicated problem of mantle dynamics with um, mantle flow and so on, but this is not done. This is just an open, open issues, just to show that this, this can be used for difficult problems ahead. 
and uh, I want to acknowledge different clients that have allowed us to publish these results in my company. And more on the fundamentals of the methods you can find in this capture by the SGE that I wrote on the encyclopedia of the SGE. You can find it online and download it. Uh, and this is a capture of an AGU book on Earth, uh, inference in Earth, uh, integrated imaging of the Earth that you can look at also for further for for the reference. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the very informative talk. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. But yeah, but Miguel will be in our department for the afternoon. So if you have uh, more questions for him, you can just stay here to chat with him. Okay. okay. Thank you. And uh, happy holidays for everyone. Okay. See you Thank next you. week. Happy Christmas. Happy next week. Couple weeks. Couple weeks. Yeah. She'll be working. Well, in fact, we answer the questions uh, during the talk. <laughs> <laughs>